Thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, for the rites and rituals um, memorializing sites of resistance and trauma in, in a modern Bermuda. Uh, my name is Catherine Hay, I'm a cultural program officer with the Department of Culture, and I am also a member of the Bermudian Harpies Committee, which is hosting this evening's event. Um, it is my great honor uh, to um, welcome the, the facilitator and the panelists for this evening. I think um, this is an incredibly important conversation, one that we are recording. We will ensure that um, uh, future um, members of the public will be able to access. We are welcoming people to um, enter any questions that they have in the chat. And um, I am, it's my honor to introduce Ms. Stephanie Gibson. Um, who is going who will be facilitating the conversation today um, a phd in the candidate at the university of pennsylvania stephanie kipson is an art 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 slash architectural historian and a cultural critic interested in the ways in which groups and societies construct their monumental landscape her dissertation looks at monuments of the black atlantic to examine the various ways varied ways architects and other designers have responded to the large and important challenges of representing and repairing the trauma and loss suffered by those communities. Her work provides a theoretical framework rooted in Black memory studies for understanding the methods and techniques that are utilized in the creation of new monuments that memorialize, memorialize trauma and pain in an effort to correct the historical record. And so um, I couldn't think of anyone better to facilitate this conversation than Stephanie, and I welcome I welcome her to begin this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for that um, beautiful introduction, Kathy. Um, I am so excited to be here um, and amongst such brilliant scholars as Dr. Christy Warren and Dr. Theodore Francis, um, two scholars whose work has informed my my research. Um, I am also very honored to speak to um, to an audience of my of my um, co-country people. I guess, um, for lack of better words, it's always an honor to speak about the place that I call home and the place that has informed my work, the place that runs deeply through through my body and and is always a touchstone for my research as I um, research across the Black Atlantic. Um, just quickly, I just want to frame the conversation and um, give a little bit of a background on how I think of sites of memory, um, specifically when it comes to sites of memory of the Black Atlantic. Um, so um, my research and interest in sites of memory started um, with Casemates, a site that I'm mm. sure we are all familiar with, um, a site that I drove past as a child to go to Sparky's, <laughs> um, a site that is rooted in Bermudian history in so many ways, a colonial, um, a colonial structure that was turned into a prison, um, the site at which Buck Burroughs and um, Tacklin were, were hanged in a fight of resistance. Um, and a site that is currently being transformed into a site of memory by the National Museum. Um, and when I think about critical Black memory, I think about sites of memory that are important touchstones for Black people that can be used to resist white supremacy and resist um, colonialism that can move us towards decolonization, and sites that correct the historical record and the historical record that has been given to us by um, by, coloni by colonizers and by people who are, um, are, are, are our oppressors. Um, but I also think about sites of memory, not just as architectural structures, but also the way in which we move throughout space. And mm. I think the best example of this are the gumbays. They are our memory, they are memory workers and they occupy space. And I think the best way to do that is when they move throughout the built environment, taking up space, stopping movement from happening and, and, and encouraging us to just watch and participate. 
and the way that they take up space, oh, sorry. Um, and the way that they take up space and encourage us to stop and occupy space, I think is an important example of decolonization, if even for that moment. Um, so with that, I would like to just think, make, I challenge us to think outside of just um, statues and what we think of as monuments, but also think of how we occupy space and how we can do that as a way to move us towards decolonization and undoing white supremacy. Um, so I have, um, so I'm going to toss it over to Dr. Warren who can speak about how she thinks about memory and then we'll just um, have a brief introduction from both of the panelists and then we will move into a more um, casual conversation about memory and, and how it can move help us to get free. So thank you. Um, Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate it. Um, I'm really happy to be here this evening to speak with um, Stephanie and Theo. I know Clarence was on the um, invite and some may be wondering where he is. He wanted to be here, but had some technical difficulties. Um, throughout, for a few years now, throughout lockdown, Theo, Clarence and I have had <laughs> conversations and I feel my biggest problem will be tonight to remember that I'm speaking to an audience, not just to friends <laughs> yes um and that's 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 a nice problem to have i think to know that i have found support with other bermudian academics who are trying to think through similar issues sometimes from different time periods or different angles but all as stephanie said with the aim of thinking towards liberation and and true liberation about and for me part of that is about freeing our imaginations so i'm in his i'm an historian definitely but i'm also trained as a sociologist. And I spent a lot of time, um, like Stephanie said, thinking about how do we create spaces? How do we create spaces of memory? And one of the things for me is kind of um, undoing the power that disciplines hold over us in the academy. Um, and some of that is through interdisciplinary work, um, but some of it is also through what Christina Sharp calls becoming undisciplined. So really thinking beyond what the academy tries to make us do in kind of com compartmentalizing knowledge and experience. And I just wanted to read a, 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 a quick couple of sentences because um, I don't think I can say it better than Haitian scholar Michelle Rolf Trio, who said within academia itself, we need to cross disciplinary boundaries much more often than we do. Today, mm -hmm. no single discipline has the capacity to conceptualize the experience of the people dismissed by the 19th century. And then he goes on to quote anthropolog anthropologist Eric R. Wolf, who wrote in 1982, and I'll quote, it is only when we integrate our different kinds of knowledge that people without history emerge as actors in their own right. When we parcel them out among several disciplines, we render them invis invisible. And by talking about people without history, it's not literally people who don't have a past. It means people who have been excluded from the discipline that we know as history. Um, and if we understand how history started, how all the disciplines started in the 19th century at a time of high imperialism, where only certain people's lives mattered and that there was a scale of how people's lives mattered, then we have to be really cautious of using the tools of these disciplines to try and understand our past especially as, as people of the African diaspora. And it doesn't mean we throw all the tools out. Some of them are useful. I go into the archive all the time, but as you said, Stephanie, it's not enough, it's limited. Um, if we only use the archive, we're getting a very skewed idea of who we are. We're getting an idea of who we are through the lens of people who didn't think that we matter, <laughs> mm -hmm. who's, who didn't feel that we were human beings. Thank you so much for that. and and. Um, there are a lot of things I want to come back and, and touch and speak about. Um, I was nodding vigorously and, and taking notes vigorously. So um, I jotted down some things that we can circle back to, but um, I would love to invite um, Dr. Francis into the conversation before we cycle back in. Thank you. Good afternoon once again, everyone. Um, sorry, just trying to find my page. I had my presentation up and I was just trying to find it. How do I um, share this presentation once I kind of get myself a little organized? Just, just simply share screen? Yes, just share screen. Okay, yeah. all right, excellent, excellent. 
Um, good afternoon, once again, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Theodore Francis uh, from Warwick, <laughs> graduate of Warwick Academy, and then I went on to Morehouse College and did my um, doctoral degree at University of Chicago. I'm currently employed at Abilene Christian University, way out in West Texas, where I teach classes on African American history, African diaspora history, with a focus on the Caribbean as well as classes on US history. Um, thank you once again for inviting me to today's panel discussion. And I think, you know, appreciate shout out to my sister scholar there, Dr. Warren, but I think I wanna take us in the direction of um, music to maybe for us to reflect on this. I'm, I'm not very skilled with the YouTube piece. So I'll just put up the lyrics to the song and you can, if you know it already, you can hum along or if you don't, um, maybe you can just search it online, whatever your music format you like to work with. Um, that's me. I think this is it, yes. Oh, uh, big screen, can we all see this? Hopefully we can all see this. Um, several years ago, it was an artist out of the island of Jamaica. In fact, the son of another reggae music artist, Chronicle, um, who, came out with his band, Chronics and the Zinc Fence Band, and they dropped an album known as, or a mixtape known as Dread and Terrible. And on the mixtape was a very poignant song that I think speaks to some of these issues of memory, trauma, and black resistance. And the, and the song was titled Captured Lamb. And I just read out the lyrics and said, Lord America, I capture lamb. The whole of Jamaica, I capture lamb. Long time them want trick the Rasta man. Like them not know, say man a real African. You think me not remember King Ferdinand and Deef in Columbus had a golden plan. They make a wrong turn, end up in the Caribbean. One Ross genocide kill nothing in the end. Turn paradise into a plantation and bring cross one shipload of Africans. Now here comes the thief and queen from England. She Cromwell and Henry Morgan, century upon top of century full of suffering. Now, after 400 years, we say no reparations. And now they want to kill you with the taxation. But I beg you, please take me to the motherland. They tell you. And then it refers back to the chorus. For those of you familiar with the song, you know this is a big tune. I'm sure air horns with the blaring lighters would be in the air if this was a different context. But since this is the professional academic conference, let's dial it back. I think Mr. Chronic raises some very important points here. Of course, it's a snapshot history that makes reference, of course, to colonial colonization, right? It makes reference to seeing a moment that one group would say is discovery. Oh, Columbus discovered the Americas. Oh, he discovered the Caribbean. He discovered this, he discovered that. And he's reframing, which lets us know that historical events are oftentimes embedded within disparate narratives. And we see that right here in Bermuda from our love for talking about Bermuda's maritime history, but oftentimes not really getting into what, now what are some of the products which are being moved around the Atlantic world during Bermuda's so-called glorious era of maritime history? Some of those products were African men, women, and children being trafficked back and forth, as well as indigenous people coming out of Virginia. Shout out to the St. David's Islanders, right? as well as others throughout the island. Consequently, what this song, Captured Lamb, points us towards, or what I would like for it to point us towards, is for us to really kind of unpack the problematic histories which are embedded in some, some of the things that we oftentimes venerate, right? And this idea of trauma and resistance are oftentimes taking place at the same time. And folks are looking at the same location, but through radically different lenses. Radically different lenses, all about the same event or same time, right? Um, that's kind of my, on the other kind of panel is, or the other column is more so an academic kind of breakdown for this idea of a captured land. And shout out once again to Mr. Chronix, because Chronix identifies Bermuda, because he lists a whole host of Caribbean 
as well as North American territories that he said are captured lands. What is he saying? These spaces which have been occupied by European colonizers and developed into a thing, a world, a society, as if they weren't societies and re with real people, with real civilizations prior to European conquest. But the ways in which we're oftentimes trained in popular school and in popular education is to look at these places as tabula rasa, like not where I have been until Europeans in a boat showed up in the 1400s or 1500s to discover and settle or civilize a space, right? And Bermuda being one of those spaces. And even though we might enjoy a certain quality of life, and that of course depends on your class and age and economic positionality within Bermuda, we still have to grapple with ways in which so much things and so much places, even within Bermuda, are troubled by histories that give one community of people trauma and invoke histories of resistance to another community of people. Moving right along with that same set of ideas, this is just, of course, an image from, of course, Chronics and the Zinc Fence Band and the Dread and Terrible album. Go check it out. No, I'm not getting paid by them, but if I got free tickets to his concert, I wouldn't say no, right? Um, but let's think about a few just basic ideas. This idea of collective memory. Who is the collective that is having these recollections? And as I said before, we can have one space that is burdened by different sets of ideas, different sets of memories or histories. We understand the layered nature of events. Identity is critical. And then we've also got to think about, it's a concept that um, I like to teach or like to reflect on. And I think it's germane to our discussion is, um, it's a scholar by the name of Patricia Seed. She dropped a book several years ago, known as Ceremonies of Possession, European Conquest of the New World, right? And she has this concept known as rituals of possession. How do folks take hold of a space? How do they lay claim to a space? And I know we can think about that very legalistically in a 2023 context and say, oh yeah, well, you know, if you wanna buy a piece of real estate, you go down to said real estate company, you, ex you discuss the, the fee, you exchange the money, you hold on to the deed. Well, that's a ritual of taking possession. But we also have a lot of informal rituals of taking possession, which we argue are just as real, right? We don't like to talk about the gang problem, but sometimes there's gangs, sometimes there's street groups in Bermuda and hey, they take possession of territory as well too. They might not have a legal deed that they can go down to HSBC with, but they have ownership of that space. How do they have ownership of that space? Let's get out of that area and let's move into something much more popular. 24th May and Cup match, guess what? People's out camping. How do we take possession of the area where we're gonna put our tent? We know that they are socially accepted ways of marking out your territory. Whether you're over on Cedar Avenue with a piece of chalk, or nowadays people use tape, right? They use tape and then they be writing their name. When Back in the day, they used to send you down there for field and cheering. You have to sit down there because your auntie told you sit down there because that's going to be our spot on the corner. And you're sitting down there all evening, all night till your next relative comes to relieve you. What ritual do we use to lay claim to space? Whether you go to the cup match game in the East or whether you go in the West, how do you identify who your favorite team is? And this is the, my team area. I ain't gonna say the names because then people's gonna say I'm partisan because I'm gonna say certain team first, like, you know what I mean? But yeah, nah. So these are some of the things we can think through how we have these rituals of taking hold of things and how have they changed? What are positions? What are rituals from the past? What are rituals from the present? And what are maybe some rituals into, that we can carry into the future? Because at the end of this year, this is why history is absolutely critical. Just want to wrap with that. Because this history matters. It matters way more than just simply memorizing some dates or some events that I can share with you. History is plugged into an individual and a community's understanding of what is possible in society. And if we don't grapple with these things, it's gonna affect how we look at trauma and how we frame resistance or whether or not we discuss these things at all or even replicate them into the future. That's my time, I appreciate you.
and I look forward to discussing this a little bit more. Thank you so much. There's so many avenues that we can go, and, I, and I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm trying to like square the circle to have you both talk about, so like to condense it, because we only have so much time. I could talk to you all for like five hours, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, and I think the thing that I keep hearing from the both of you is the past <laughs> making itself present in our present, mm -hmm. and how that happens both through our physical understanding of space and I guess our mental understanding of space. Um, Christy, you mentioned the archive and how that is a space and a site, right? Um, even though it's not, well, it also is a physical site, but it takes up a, a, a mental and intellectual um, space. Um, and then the Theodore, you mentioned um, just the rituals that take place in space. Um, and mm -hmm. I would love for you to both talk about, um, I, I think you touched on it, but I would like for you to like expand um, if you mm -hmm. could, Christy, about like the violence of the archive. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we can talk, and then we can move to the violence of displacement of people that you that you mm -hmm. alluded to, um, Leo. So we can um, go start there. Mm -hmm. Actually, sorry, and also to, to save time, then if you could tie into how we can get ourselves free from both of those mm. things. That way we can, okay. I know that's so much, but that way um, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at the time and I'm like, how can we do this and allow for some Q&A? So if you, okay. yeah. And you can well, maybe, maybe we can just works. have a chat with each other. Yeah, that works. See yeah, how, works. Yeah. how we think both I'm to each other. I'm that out so then you can um, yes, yes. go back and forth, yeah. Um, so, Someone I go to a lot um, when I'm thinking about the violence of the archives is Sadia Hartman, who writes. Yeah. Mm. And I'm yeah. finding a lot, the people that I draw on actually aren't trained, um, aren't within history departments. They're yeah. dealing mm -hmm. with archival yeah. documents and histories yeah. and thinking about the past, but they're mm -hmm. coming at it from a different angle than historians often do. And historians mm -hmm. are now starting to draw on them. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's interesting to watch yeah. that happen. <laughs> um, but with Sadia Hartman, um, she talks about a couple of things, one called racial calculus and the other mm -hmm. called political arithmetic mm -hmm. um, that were entrenched centuries ago. So, um, but that live into the present. So that idea of trying to separate the past from the present doesn't work. Yeah. And I was talking to, oh, I don't think he minds me saying, my brother today, talking mm -hmm. about this relationship between the past and the present. And he he works in psychology, so he was coming at it from a psychological point of view about how people who are trapped in the past kind of are stuck with depression. People who kind of um, are looking to the future often have anxiety, this idea of not being present. Um, so mm -hmm. for me, in getting past this problem of being stuck in the past is understanding this connectivity between the past present and future? How do they connect and kind of influence each other? And I think the problem, a lot of the problem is that we don't acknowledge how much of the past is still with us, how much mm -hmm. it underpins the things that we understand to be true, the things that we take for granted. Um, in the same piece that I was talking about from Trio, he was talking about um, the North Atlantic fictions of universalism. Mm -hmm. And to mm -hmm. break that down a little bit, like these things that we take for granted as being true for everybody mm -hmm. are not, they're constructed. <laughs> they're, they're made up to benefit certain people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And when we don't spend time kind of digging under them and accepting, just accepting the story as it's kind of been mm -hmm. presented or preserved, that's when we run into problems. And that's part of when I'm talking about the ar a violence of the archives, that's what I'm talking about because that racial calculus and political arithmetic, that kind of, she's talking about it in math, but I always think about it kind of mm -hmm. acrobatics, this kind of mm -hmm. kind of positioning and moving yeah. that people have done to keep a social, create and keep a certain social order is still with us. And that exists right. within the archives, that, right. that echo of that past social order. Yeah. So Sadia Hartman wrote an article called Venus in Two Acts, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. she thinks through a story of Theo, you know the story. <laughs> he said, we go. You can feel you can correct me if I go off too far or get it wrong. Um, where she talks about 
um, she had been writing a book and she came across a story of enslaved girls on a ship and her reaction was basically to try and beat almost to rescue them from the past right and like mm -hmm. this idea that actually that's not possible mm -hmm. and she kind of develops this idea called critical fabulation yeah. so this mm -hmm. way of, of engaging with these violent archives by remembering that they're human beings, by approaching mm -hmm. them as human beings uh, ourselves, meaning other mm -hmm. human beings, mm -hmm. that we're not going mm -hmm. to take what the archive says um, mm -hmm. as the end of the story, as mm -hmm. the limits of the story, that the fact that we can't get at their voice from the archives is a limit, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> that we can't get at their emotions and their feelings about mm -hmm. this is a limit. Um, so for me, it's thinking about, um, like Theo was talking about, for me about moving towards freedom is thinking about, well, how have people in the African diaspora um, chronicled and remembered the, the past themselves? Right. Mm -hmm. And we get to the things that we've already started talking about. We have the gun base. That mm -hmm. is a form of memory in the present. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. a continued It's a continued mm -hmm. ceremony. It's a continued form of resistance. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's something that, changes as well if we look at the ways the gumbays look today that's not the same as they did in the early 20th century it's definitely right. not what gumbays look like in the 19th century right. so it's not a static um yeah. um kind of monument if we're thinking about right. that it's yeah. not like a statue or it it lives it's actual yeah. people <laughs> um living and breathing yeah. and kind of bringing these stories um and extending these stories in the present yeah. Mm. No, I'm not. Yeah, I, 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 let me just jump in on that because I appreciate you bringing up Hardiman because um, my wife introduced me to reading her. So, you know, respect, mm -hmm. right? And I appreciate <laughs> you reading her because, again, this to put Hardiman's framing or at least a, a version of Hardiman's framing in conversation with that Amos Wilson quote I, I dropped earlier, you know, mm, it's like yeah. The history is at the core of the con of the consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Not to go all off in kind of abstract, but it is. It's like how, how we think about concepts. When you tell tell somebody, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. Well, that's not possible. You know, right. Um, right. not to mm -hmm. resurrect. Well, yeah, not necessarily resurrect, but I will. I'll revisit. Uh, very recently, myself and Dr. Tito Smore were involved with doing the commissioner inquiry work, and you know, obviously the the outcome of having a historical inquiry into the problematic nature of this land dispossessions, we'll say that this land grab is the next is an ethical or moral question. Well, shouldn't there be some type of restitution? Shouldn't there? And you heard this kind of almost knee jerk type of response of, oh, that's not possible because this, because this, mm -hmm. because that, and a third, right? And what is forgotten is the history of reparations first being deployed to right. compensate slavehood mm -hmm. in this island Bermuda? Mm -hmm. In this island yeah. Bermuda, not, not, not in outer space, in this <laughs> island Bermuda. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and it was more slave right. than it was people dispossessed mm -hmm. in Dakistan or in St. David's. Mm -hmm. But that's not possible, meanwhile, this is. So once again, two years, it's like, and, and Hardiman's idea of critical fabulation involves what? It's only fabulation or kind of the exaggerated or, or we could even say fantasy, sci-fi, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, because it is bestowing, not it only, one of the reasons why is because it bestows a level of humanity and a level of dignity and respect and sometimes economic compensation for categories who have been so mm -hmm. historically dis dismissed, meaning black right. people and poor people mm -hmm. primarily and women, mm -hmm. that it is almost unimaginable. And that is definitely where we see what prisoners of a certain kind of history. Mm -hmm. Prisoners, like, even the biggest, most conscious, well-educated people, but very prisoners of these concepts of literally thinking inside the box. And right. I recognize the irony of that as I say this on Zoom, because someone will be listening to this from inside a box as they really phone and look at me inside a next box, box up on box. But I still gotta say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, and um, I think the thing that excites me about Hartman's um, idea of critical fabulation is the way in which it kind of expands the bounds of academia mm -hmm. and it challenges the way in which we are 
trained to think about history and write about history. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that um, gives us an example of how we can get free from this, from the disciplines, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is a really big question, um, but it ties kind of back to what you were saying, Theo, about um, about the thing that's coding us is a lack of, I don't want to say a lack of imagination because I don't think we have a lack of imagination, but a lack of being willing to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being willing to challenge, um, I guess, discipline and authority. Um, mm -hmm. And that brings me to like, how would, how can we think as academics, I, I, I think, I think of myself as someone who is thinking us free. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say that, that's a little, hub that has hubris to it. But um, um, imagine trying to point us in the direction of how we can think ourselves free, right? Which is mm -hmm. also thinking a lot about what ac academics can do. But I guess mm -hmm. in your work, how are you doing that uh, idea of like getting us free through your work? And mm. then how would you imagine, what would your ideal like site of memory be that could mm. help us to move towards freedom? Mm. That's right. That's so mm -hmm. <laughs> Christy, you wanna jump in or? I'm I'm thinking, Stephanie, at the moment, a lot about everyday forms of resistance. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the big kind of moments are really important. And mm -hmm. and I think that's something that we need, still need to discuss because we still don't talk about them well, well enough. So I'm <laughs> yeah. not trying to dismiss the big moments. It's something that mm -hmm. we need to deal with. But I'm thinking about everyday forms of resistance because I think the way that history has been constructed and the way that we've m been led to think about the world um, we devalue our everyday forms of just exerting our humanity yeah. in Bermuda. Mm -hmm. um, and and Theo was saying something about Black people, poor people, women, like the idea of all the people that history continues, has marginalized and continues to marginalize. How have we kind of worked to, to display and live to the fullness of our humanity of mm. Bermudians. And what spaces is that has that happened? So we have that in kind of ritualized spaces like the gum bays and those types of things. But I think we also can find it in, mm -hmm. in things that maybe don't sound as exciting initially, but I think they're amazing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the pride that people take in their work, the craftsmen mm -hmm. that we have in Bermuda who are amazing mm -hmm. as, a, as a current um, kind of, I think I was telling you earlier this week, the current passion of mine to learn more about Bermudian craftsmen um, throughout the 20th mm -hmm. century, cedar workers, um, mm -hmm. shipbuilders. Milton Hill just did a piece this week on thinking about Bermuda's maritime heritage. Mm -hmm. um, that's something I'm really interested in at the moment as well. We've had, we've had um, for centuries, we have had people that have contributed to um, wider society who have not, mm -hmm. whose contribution has not been valued. Um, this idea of what type of work is important or not important or valuable mm -hmm. has often mm -hmm. been kind of a um, kind of been scaled against who has been exploited as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think about that a bit. Um, and I think about, if we think about the communities, if we if we connect that, I think, Theo, to what you were talking about, the communities that were displaced, mm -hmm. a lot of the arguments mm -hmm. for displacing was they weren't contributing enough, that they weren't using right. the land well right. enough, that the land mm -hmm. could be used better by somebody else, which is mm -hmm. a really kind of colonial tactic. Yeah, mm -hmm. of, oh, 1, of, yeah. Yes, what is productive, <laughs> what is useful, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. despite the fact that they were making healthy communities, <laughs> that they were yeah. happy, mm -hmm. creating yeah. happiness, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that they were supporting each other. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not like, I'm not trying to say it was some sort of utopia. I mean, I've heard, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I've heard mm -hmm. stories, like mm -hmm. these places aren't perfect. They had their own prejudices. They had their own um, struggles and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. these were real rounded human beings and human full human lives and mm -hmm. i think have, spending some time um validating that in in the way that we think about our past and present because that still exists it's not like that's a, just the past problem right. is part is for me that's part of resistance and i know that sounds quieter but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really important in my work 
No, no, I think that's excellent. I appreciate you um, um, directing us towards the everyday because mm -hmm. I think uh, I think one of the challenges in, in of Bermuda too has been, I think, has been just the fact that we've been embedded within the kind of tourism economy for a little while and not to fold that it's got its own sets of issues, but you know, international business has its own set of issues. Large universities have their own sets of issues and we can you know, <laughs> pass out the details. But I think one of the challenges of tourism is sometimes it causes us to be outward facing and think about where it's, what's a historic monument, a site, an event that can be put on a postcard and kind of packaged and put on a postcard. So, our approaches are, are kind of, it, it produces this kind of transactional approach to history as, as a thing, right? As, as, a, as, an, as an enterprise, not a thing, as an enterprise. Therefore, it's like, okay, if we can snap a picture of this rock and say something happened, there's Spanish rock, you know, maybe it's Portuguese rock. <laughs> but, but, you know, we snap a picture of it and we put it on a postcard. Oh, this is where this shipwreck happened. Tourists want to see it. We snap a picture and put it on a postcard. And it then has the framing of history as an attraction for outsiders to look at and value rather than history as a legacy for us to build on to that give us some type of cultural understanding as a people. And those elements of history, they exist and they're there. But to your point, Christy, and I appreciate you raising it, is they're less venerated. They're just stories auntie tells you or the stories your papa tells you, or your stories some other elder person tells you, but they're not necessarily treated with the kind of um, sanctity and reverence and the deservingness of building broader institutional program in Iran, funding, <laughs> you know what I mean, with serious funds from, and respect to Ministry of <laughs> you know, Cultural Affairs for organizing this discussion. So yes, this is going in the right direction, appreciate that. However, at a broader sense, what happens with them, right? And oftentimes we see that at moments of large transition. Okay, recently, you know, the schools were about to be changed up. So folks are saying, oh, wow, you know, this particular school, I remember this teacher, back to these traditions of excellence, right? I remember this teacher, they had a strong influence on my life and they pointed me in this direction. So we have a variety of sites around Bermuda, whether it's schools, you know, sand, secondary, some people remember their elders might remember Temperance Hall, right? Howard Academy and these other sites around the island, which really deserve to be not just marked with a kind of, you know, a brass plaque or some type of statue, but also invested in to say, what were the skill sets and cultural practices that gave that space value? You know, myself right now, I'm working on Black Tourism Project, knock on wood, be done by the end of the year because my publisher, they'd be emailing me and I'm like the bad student who hasn't finished his homework right now, but um, working on a, a manuscript about black tourism in Bermuda. And you've got a number of these places from Ripley, you know, Canville, Archland Villa, you know, Sunset Lodge. These are hotels that black Bermudians created at a time when they were banned from the Castle Harbors and the Princess Hotels. So what type of A, business acumen do you need to A, do that at a time when black folks can't march down to the bank on Front Street and get the biggest loan and do the biggest development. What type of business and saving skills? What? There's some skill sets these folks have. That's a history that we can pass on to young folks that you don't need to send them to overseas, to Canada or America or whatever, England, to get training in business set. You got some elders walking around this island right now or maybe sitting in a restroom or convalescing in someone's back room because they had that skill set and doing that at a time of racial segregation yeah and navigating diasporic networks to advertise i think we can yeah. go yeah. on and on and on yes. right? yeah <laughs> yes yeah. and i think that links to the idea of how to move towards freedom that idea of yeah. using this Mm -hmm. You have sites and letting people know where they are. But yeah. I agree with you, Theo. I, I was somewhere and I looked at a plaque and I was thinking, but people don't know this place. They don't know anything about it, what happened here, the people were, what their belief system was. Mm -hmm. And there was another place I went to this week um, that actually linked, I've been on a family reunion this week. And right. I've been learning about mm -hmm. some of my ancestors. 
Um, I've, I knew a lot because I've done a lot of research, but I've learned more because I've been talking mm -hmm. to other people. So I have different angles. I've got stuff that I wasn't able to know before. So it's once again, that idea of collective knowledge of, right. of sitting and talking. Um, what did he call, what was that book called? Grounding with my brothers, that idea Ronnie, of- Yeah, Rodney. Yeah. Yes, Walter Rodney. That idea of a process of approaching um, these ideas that doesn't privilege one person's I, form of knowledge or one way mm -hmm. of looking at the world that we have to kind of um, approach these things in, um, in a collective way, in a community-minded mm -hmm. way. So I was at First Church of God Angle Street this week. Mm -hmm. um, so how many people know about Grant who started Angle Street? Um, exactly. <laughs> who know who know who, what he did when he did it in the 1920s um right. uh mm -hmm. that was um and then coming out of that the connection to that with the recorder for instance we still have mm -hmm. brown the place yes indeed you know um and there are people talking to him i know um i've seen articles in the paper snaith simmons i believe has okay yes uh, spoken to him a lot but it's like mm -hmm. how much of this is kind of being integrated into the way that we think about ourselves um, now. And you're right, the idea of skill sets, mm -hmm. of, of having this knowledge of a past that tells us someone someone like us has done this before. Mm -hmm. yes, Not that indeed. long ago. <laughs> indeed, mm -hmm. indeed, you know? Yes. And, indeed. Yes. and thinking about how we think about current um, kind of tools to help us move forward, because mm -hmm. there's a lot, you know, there's a lot that we can learn from the present as well. Yes, most definitely. And I think also you're, you're very right because it's, it's crazy. Stephanie raised this idea about academics having a way to think us into freedom or think us into greater freedom. And I think that's useful. Yeah, respect to that. And I mean, people like Amos Wilson, people like um, you mentioned Walter Rodney, Dr. Walter Rodney out of Guyana, and several others have, have reflected on their work, right? But unless there's a conduit for this knowledge to actually mm -hmm. have a material impact in these societies which right. we love or come from, you know, mm -hmm. how does the brilliant idea or the brilliant paper that you might write, Dr. Christie, you mm -hmm. know, how does that kind of funnel its way back to mm -hmm. Bermuda? And, yeah. and likewise, too, is in recognizing these sites and then connecting to the people who kind of made their lives and made these innovations in Bermuda. You mentioned Grant, and of course, Grant with the Garvey movement, right? How does that impact not only Bermuda, but globally, right? Yeah. Um, thinking about education, you know, you've got people like Hudson who ran a school in St. David's, right? You know, yeah. and, and the folks that he impacted, you know, you think about Temperance Hall, you know, um, people like um, Dr. Eva Hudson, you know? <laughs> and being educated in these spaces and then going on to impact not just Bermuda history, but globally. Mm -hmm. These folks have a footprint internationally, mm -hmm. you know? So even just recognizing the traditions of excellence mm -hmm. that have right. been born, raised, and shaped here in Bermuda. And that's what that history helps us to connect with, you know? That's what that history helps us to connect with. Even likewise, like I said, you know, individuals from Donald Smith's travel agency and Hilton Hughes travel agency. You know, we just think, okay, people going abroad, but these people are, these men were helping Black Bermudians navigate travel mm -hmm. overseas at a time when not only Bermuda was segregated, but also there was segregation in the States, mm -hmm. you know? So the sets, these histories have to be connected not only to these sites, but all these communities, but also that then uncovers these broader traditions of excellence, whether it's traditions of excellence and service that are occurring at the same time or sometimes before Black people even allowed to work in some of the big hotels. <laughs> you know, sometimes people are like, oh, you got excellent service because you worked at this Elbow Beach or Princess, you know, well, what about people having excellent hospitality skills because they worked at Black Wooden or guest houses? Now that's an interesting frame of thought, <laughs> you right. know, but again, too, just mm -hmm. helping us reconnect with the ways in which our own communities have stimulated very useful and very um, mm -hmm. important skill sets that sometimes do not get recognized if we don't identify the places where these happen, but not only the places, to Chris's point, the people and the communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Um you both raised really important points and, and touched on like the 
resistance in memorializing the everyday mm-hmm. and and heralding those who came before us in the everydayness of of living while black right and living under white supremacy and and, and colonization and the ways in which our ancestors have kind of given us a blueprint of how we can how we can get ourselves more free every each and every day. Um, I am looking at the time, and I do want to give time for um, if there are any questions in the audience. If not, we can always go back to having such a rich conversation. Um, are there any questions? I have not been monitoring the chat. I think. There, uh, I haven't actually seen any questions, but I'd oh. remind everyone that they can also um, pose any questions in the chat or in the Q and A. Okay. Oh, we can keep talking about. <laughs> Not that we, I don't. I love. I'd love to have questions, but um, I, I wanted to just pull in one other reference then, because okay, yes, that'd be great. Um, Neil talking about um, tourism made me. I was I was thinking about history at that point, and something that I found really useful recently is is well, there's a couple of things to think about, like. Um, mm-hmm. Some of there's some really good writing across the from across the Caribbean from the 60s and 70s um, that it seems and even and, and this is including Bermuda that is like often out of print, inaccessible in other ways. Yeah. So this is one of the issues of trying to get at it. It's also then how do you take this information, which is sometimes written not kind of in an accessible way? How do you then make sure that this information can be translated for wider audiences? And I'm thinking here, especially about students Mm -hmm. kind of um, in islands like Sylvia Winter, or I'm thinking right now about Wilson Harris. He he had a lecture series that was published in 1970 called History, Fable, and Myth. And he was talking about the importance of um, drawing on folk tradition, what people call folk traditions, fables, myths, and legends. as a process of getting more free. So yeah. it's once again to me about that, those things that academia, um, the discipline right. of history dismissed as not important mm-hmm. or kind of mm-hmm. marginalized traditionally, um, mm-hmm. but that for understanding who we are as a people and kind of going forward is really important. So I, I had forgotten at the beginning, I was I meant to show you my video. I'm not gonna show it now, it's, it's a bit too long, mm-hmm. but I'll talk about the video I did with Amy Zanders really quickly. Yes, um, so that idea of, of um, we, Amy Sanders and I for the biennial last year did a video um, concerning Sally Bassett. And for us, mm. it was really important that it was a non-linear narrative. So that means we layered over the information we had learned about her, about how she was remembered by Black Remedians and the way that she was um, mis... I don't know if misremembered is a word, but... Um, Dismembered. I- Yes, denigrated <laughs> by by um, specifically the tour the tourism industry where mm-hmm. she was um, created into a bell and and sold um, as a trinket mm-hmm. in in a tourist shop. Mm-hmm. So in this piece, we were thinking about those different layers of what happened to her and how that's remembered in Bermuda. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of what we were trying trying to think about and and by not thinking about a linear narrative is we don't get her voice ever. <laughs> so mm-hmm. what we're layering is how different people have thought about her mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. she has been remembered. Um, and then thinking about that against the archive in which she is right. silent. And actually in this case, she's silent by choice. She's given a chance to speak mm-hmm. and she chooses not to. And I so, I see that as a form of resistance. Mm-hmm. Sometimes yeah. silence mm-hmm. can be a form of resistance mm-hmm. and that she actually chooses who she speaks to she chooses mm-hmm. to save her voice for other enslaved people, for other Black people when she leaves it. And how do we know that? Um, we know that through myth and and folk tradition and story. Um, yeah. Can we prove she said that? No. But does that matter? Equally, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because, because the way that we kind of come to understand ourselves is made mm-hmm. up of more than just what definitely happens. It's made up mm-hmm. of how people right. understand themselves in time and space and how they relate mm-hmm. to certain figures in certain time periods. So the mm-hmm. idea of the Bermudiana growing out of her embers for me is a, an important mm-hmm. symbol. Um, mm-hmm. People might say, oh, that never happened. Well, uh, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, mm-hmm. but it means it, it shows you yeah. a certain meaning mm-hmm. um, that goes beyond what the archive could ever give us. Yeah. Um, and what we get is a, a her in place. So mm-hmm. I guess part of the thing is um, part of like living in the fullness of being is that things change over time. Yeah. But what work do, are we doing to make sure really key things aren't forgotten? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, really important traditions yeah. aren't forgotten. Like we, we talk about things now, even with language about, oh, that's how older Bermudians speak. You can hear how I speak or mm -hmm. um, that isn't you know, like there's there are things lost and there are reasons for that. My own life mm -hmm. experience has been very different. But how do we how do we capture things that have been thought of as being Bermudian? Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's yeah. part of of thinking about um, us being free as well, of, of yeah. us not not of us respecting and valuing um our culture <laughs> yeah yeah i and, think yeah i'm oh, sorry sorry no 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 i was just thinking back to like the 80s when there was an i well maybe not that far i'm going back too far maybe but this idea that remedians did don't have culture <laughs> right uh, uh, okay. right I'll, yeah see, i was, I was actually you. just about to go there <laughs> okay go there go there go yeah, there um, yeah, I'll, I'll <laughs> yeah i think there's so much, there's so many things I want to, I'm looking at the time, I'm like, how can I condense this really quickly? Um, um, I think what you were touching on about this idea of myth and um, oh, and this idea of, and we've talked about this, this difference between history and heritage, right? And how those are not the same thing. Um, and history is what we think of as like, history with a capital H and what is being written down. And then, and, how counter memory can kind of serve us to get free and how we can create heritage, create history through mythology, through um, through stories that we tell ourselves from our elders, from culture that lives around us. And by and the, the idea of for me not having culture kind of is a way of dismissing the that life that's underneath the history with a capital h um mm -hmm. and i could go on and on about this and i don't want to <laughs> drone on but um yes sorry, no i think you've brought yeah. that together really well yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, yeah no no i i just just to concur i mean i think in you know just circling back to that that um set of concepts that christy just shared you know it's 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 always this ongoing process and challenge right you know and as well too you know even though that even though there is resistance it's never like a zero-sum game right sometimes we're like okay you know the enterprise in 1835 is resistance because the guys got free but what about all the multiple times of folks fighting against slavery and they didn't necessarily get free permanently mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. at least in a kind of unchanged context of freedom right mm -hmm. you talk about spiritual freedom etc at you know to infinity so to speak but likewise even just thinking back to the context of like Tuckestan and you know the land grabs that occurred there by Bermuda Development Company and Furnace Bivy and you know that whole ritual of possession you know the the ways in which these white bermudian elites as well as british and american elites were were empowered by the white british white british colonial um, power structure as well as certain elites like gosman and sperlin and others to take that land right for the use of a segregated to create a kind of segregated tourist resort and the fact that there were numerous people who spoke out against it yeah. they resisted right however yeah. they mm -hmm. you know the outcome didn't come out for them mm -hmm. in a in a type of material sense whereby yeah. they were unable to keep the land but they resisted they complained right. they kicked up mm -hmm. they tried to have separate tribunals and there's numbers not only just Dinah smith but you know you've got the Talbots and several others mm -hmm. who make a big fuss about this but unfortunately they did not have the kind of power at that moment in a kind of legal or political mm -hmm. sense to get their way Mm -hmm. However, back to Krista's point, you know, folklore once again, right? Donna Smith is one of the last holdouts, and not only does she kind of stay in place, but we find records of her literally being put out of her place. Interestingly enough, more than likely by new white British police officers who had who had recently been brought to the island for the reason of creating more security on the island because they felt that once Bermuda had once Bermuda had been developed for more um, elite and we'll just say rich white tourists, they felt that, hey, the police force needed to be improved mm -hmm. and improving it at that time meant getting white men from Britain to come down here and police the black folks. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is going back to that idea of folk stories and what we sometimes think is 
just comment is the old song that they say at Odie Rhyme that she used to say that, you know, Goodwin Gosman is a thief and everybody knows it, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this kind of interesting little poetic song or rap or jingle that she had returning back to this idea of music, music. You know, you would think I planned that. But, um, <laughs> you know, this idea of mm -hmm. us as a community, Bermuda embedded within the Caribbean, part of mm -hmm. the greater Caribbean. And the use of these ways to speak to power, even though power didn't oftentimes listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And power didn't necessarily move in the ways that these folks wanted, but it spoke back to power. Right. And what do we remember from Donna Smith? Well, the narrative says that we have an arrest warrant for her to be evicted. We, I can show you that. I found that in an archive. But mm -hmm. anthropology reveals that, hey, Goodwin Gosman was a thief and everybody knew it. He carries Ron whistle and Stanley Sperling blows it, you know? So it's this idea of sometimes these folk traditions, those country ordinary everyday traditions mm -hmm. are the tools that we use to maintain a legacy, right? Whether it's a legacy of resistance, whether it's a tradition of pride of place, whether it's a tradition to say we stood up, even though we didn't get out of the way, some days it's about standing up, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So all of those traditions encapsulate mm -hmm. sometimes into the things, the small age history, right. that the big age history mm -hmm. sometimes didn't have time for. Yeah, and, and, and making sure we don't overlook those everyday moments where we move closer and closer. To, mm. to freedom through everyday resistance, um, which Absolutely. I think has been the theme of tonight. Um, I do have a question from the audience. Um, mm. And the, the audience member asks, um, in the political realm, we see a lot of talk about being a quote, new day and race, and race being a factor in holding us back from making the right choices in our elected bodies. How can we hold space for a new day or progression whilst holding our elected officials accountable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a that's a big question. So maybe I'll tackle a bit of it because theory if you're thinking. Yeah. Um, I think for me, part of it is it it's to what we've been talking about. So the idea of race still being a factor holding us back. I think what's holding us back is an unwillingness to face how much the past is still in the present. So that mm. that and so it's not just race, it's the construction, the constructions of society of which race is an important factor in Bermuda. Um and when I'm teaching now, I and I go back to kind of um the the settle, settlement in in the caribbean by colonizers i talk to them about the construction of whiteness i start with the construction of whiteness against mm -hmm. the idea of blackness and the idea of that, that these are these are structures that are created to maintain um an elite and this is still something we're struggling with not with race yes but across the board that we're still struggling with the idea that an elite finds ways to maintain itself. Um, and what who that elite is kind of can shift and change. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's what I think we need to dismantle, how we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's a difficult thing to do because there are people, there's a vested interest in maintaining the order that exists. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, indeed, indeed, indeed. I mean, thank you, because I'll take that segue if you don't mind that and um, continue with that thought, because you're right, these systems that we feel say are the normative systems are also part of the problem, right? And um, the idea of a new day is marked by far deeper changes than just simply electing different name people with a different group of acronyms <laughs> to occupy a seat of power, which was never ever constructed to deliver the level of justice that we might imagine, right? You know, cause you've got, you know, and I appreciate you um, sharing that um, 
Christy, in terms of construction of whiteness and construction of these authority systems, right? right? We, on one hand, Bermuda loves to ring the bell and, you know, you know, we've got the oldest parliament operating outside of Britain and, you know, but that might also be a problem, <laughs> right? That might also be part of the problem, you know? And some of these structures, not some of these structures, the structure writ large um, is part of the issue. And the reproduction of an elite, whether it is a all white front street, oligarchy or whether or not it is a black oligarchy, uh, black oligarchy or whether it's a kind of biracial oligarchy with now with corporate, you know, offshore financing as its backers, whereas at a different moment, it might have been, you know, front street hotels as its backers. You know, the specific identity of the players you know, we can save that for a broader discussion, but to speak to the person's question, I think we need to have a more clear-eyed understanding of the hood that those histories still have over us. The fact that they're not just washed away in the past ever since the PLP got elected in 1990 something, and hey, it's supposed to be a new day. <laughs> um, and this is even why you've seen you know, once again, and our need again to let me before I get down that road, even our need to have deeper conversations with our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, whether it's officially through CARICOM or just socially through our own kind of social media or discussion groups. Why? Because the idea of a black elite under a flag of independence reproducing some of the problematic behaviors of the white colonial establishment. We've got a track record for that. And we can see other people's pitfalls. And not to say that independence is not a desirable goal, most definitely, but it's also to help us recognize that you can also have black people in a position whereby they exploit other black people too, right? And this conversation is so layered, but it also touches back to something Dr. Warren mentioned as well, too, with this idea of a better reverence or recognition of the everyday instead of thinking about these grand things that, you know, what about, what are there, what is there rather within our cultural environment, within our societies that is worthy of uplifting and value, right? <laughs> so that we can produce a kind of social change that is beneficial, not just Bermuda as a whole, but the people at the lesser, hands of Bermuda, whether that's economically, whether that's socially, however we construct it, right? Because creating more justice within the whole society uplifts the entire society. You know, not just making a couple of guys at the top rich, like, <laughs> okay, and one of their friends too. Okay, great, so I was their friend this year, so I'm gonna vote for them. But what happens when I'm not their friend? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What happens when the, public, the paper I publish ticks them off and they ain't my friend no more? You know, so thinking about these bigger ideas of social justice, it, it, it becomes a challenge, but again, it's embedded within the ways in which we kind of reverence these structures of power, which Brian never created to give us liberation in the first place. Thank you so much for that. Um, and um, I'm looking at the time and I just want to close with one question that I guess, um, mm -hmm can once again challenge our imagination. Um, so if we're thinking about widening our understanding of what monuments, memorials, and sites of memory can be and what they should be, um, mm -hmm. what would you, like if you could, if, you were, if I were to give you some money now to <laughs> create a site of memory, um, what do you think we should use and what can we use or what can we choose to mark physical sites and commemorate our, our history as, as Bermudian? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I'm not trying to sidestep the question, honestly, but the first <laughs> thing I would say is find out what Bermudians actually want. Hmm. Um, 
what do they want, what do Bermudians more generally want to, how do Bermudians want to mark sites? And actually for me, as part of a larger question is, do we want to continue marking sites? Because as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of sites that are marked that we still don't know or understand. We don't understand the significance, you know, um, I was talking to my cousin this today. It's like they come up maybe at a holiday, like it might be Heroes Day or something else, and we'll talk about it kind of on a surface level and we move on. Um, so I still think for me, it's about embedding knowledge in community, um, embedding um, um, embedding respect in ourselves, actually. Um, we, I, we have a lot of physical memorials and statues and markers. Um, in the landscape for a very small country. And they're interesting. That's actually something I'm not saying, I don't think they're valuable at all. I have loads of photos of these <laughs> markers that explain what everything means. But I also see that when I'm looking at them, other people are just walking by. Mm -hmm. I mean, to, to add on to that, thank you very much for being the person who can who says, ah, not no more statues because I, I was afraid I was going to be the bad guy. <laughs> but, but, but thank you very much. Uh, um, I maybe want to close or speak to that with how I started. Definitely utilize, and if there was some magic pot of money, to speak to Bermudians about what do they want, how do they want to memorialize things, for sure, but also building up the small age history. What about the interviews? What about funds for the musicians, artists, you know, and variety of artists, dance, painting, what have you, to produce things so that that information can keep circulating? Um, I listen to American hip hop from time to time, and it's interesting that both younger generations and the kind of old school guys that I listen to both mention Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. How is it that that continuity of an African American civil rights narrative has been reproduced? And we can speak to specific locations of reproducing that information, but what do our young people know about Dr. Paulo Chemical Figo, you know, Roosevelt Brown? You know, Dr. I mean, Dean Lewis, Braun Evans, brother who just passed, may he rest in peace, brother Ottawell Simmons, you know? Um, and these are the names who not only are individuals who had meaning to the families, but also worked very hard for the liberation of Black people at various points throughout Bermuda's history. How are those individuals and other groups and organizations how are their names gonna be able to be recirculated? Because it's in the sharing of this information. Once those individuals' names, as well as the um, types of worlds and freedoms that they work to, to create in Bermuda, once those ideas become as powerful or as meaningful in the minds of people as God Save the Queen and a Union Jack and all that idea, hey, that's when we'll see the kind of freedom that we believe we're imagining. But as long as the whole kind of go to the queen and that kind of colonial narrative is bigger and has more concrete weight in the minds of Bermudians, both old and young, you know, you can build the nicest and prettiest of statues. It'll be just like Dr. Warren said, it'll be pretty. Everybody will clap at the ribbon cutting. And then a week later, when you're on your way to the grocery store, you'll drive right across the deep when you go. So it is the maintenance of the kind of historical narrative in the mind and the consciousness of the people that's more powerful. And that's the stronger monument that, yeah? That's the stronger monument, at least to me in this time. Thank you. That was a really beautiful way to close. And I thank both of you for being here in conversation with me. Um, I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone in the audience learned a lot. And, and I think we started a conversation that needs to continue to happen. Um, I thank the Bermuda Community and Culture Affairs for hosting this for us, um, for holding space for us to have a conversation of how we can move towards freedom. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Stephanie, you did an amazing job. And um, to all of our panelists, and we welcome any feedback afterwards. Uh, we welcome, we will be having the second panel discussion with um, creatives. We'll be announcing the panel um, members on the 10th of August. 
with a similar format um, because it, it, it's a beautiful segue from the question of how do we carry on and to how do the, our creators imagine um, such memorializing and, and holding of memory um, can take place and in, in projecting into the future. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're really thankful for all of you. Um, and we're and I, I speak for a lot of people by saying um, we're really, really proud and grateful for you. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.